Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast presented by Zwift for the last mountain stage of the Giro d'Italia, stage 20 from Belluno to Marmaloda, Passo Fedaia, three main climbs of the day. Passo, Sparkling Water, San Pellegrino, 10Ks, 8%, after about 70K, nah, 50Ks of flat, and then there's some lower gradients before. Descent, then a 20-kilometer false flat uphill valley through a beautiful area of the Dolomites to Passo Portadoi, 12K, 6.5%, big road, 2,200 meters, the Chimacopia this year's Giro, not it's like a 30 minute climb not that hard a climb then a descent and a stepped sort of descent false flat valley of like 30 28 kilometers to the base of the Paso Fadaya, which is a climb in two parts the first half is not very difficult you need domestiques there the first seven k is like five percent the last five and a half k's are 11 percent. that's just a pure 20 minute watts per kilo test and you can't hide, and teammates can't really help you either. Going into the stage, to remind you, Carapaz nursing a slender three-second lead on Hindley. Lander on 105, so Lander with a lot to do ahead of the TT. Needley and Bilbao and Hit kind of all out of the podium action. So it's between the big three, and Bora and Bahrain got men in the break, Benji. They got some what I thought were satellite riders there. Yes, certainly, and uh, they got riders in there, but it wasn't in the first move. For example, we had Dries de Bonda, New Jensen trying to go in the breakaway, got caught, and then it started becoming the riders that would eventually land into the breakaway that would matter today. Giulio Ciccone was the uh, first one to make proper moves together with some Ormond, Zardini, Mauri von Sevenant, and Formolo. After that, there were riders joining, like a and Idens one once again after getting second on the Hirt stage uh, a few weeks, a few days ago. <laughs> Doesn't feel like weeks yet. Much of Under Pool, uh, Kovi, and Sylvain Monique. And next to that, it was also Formula trying to uh, be in there for UA. So we had two riders of UAE at that point. But then we started looking at Ballerini trying to bridge up, Leonard Kemna trying to bridge up. And we also had Domin Novak actually joining that breakaway. So, like you mentioned, Kemna for Bora, Domin Novak for Bahrain here. And next to that, riders for UAE, not anymore for Almeida because he's not in the race anymore. But that breakaway, Ballerini seemed to be a, a proper engine in this breakaway for Von Sevenon for quite a bit, but I felt like at a certain point that Ballerini was looking stronger than Von Sevenon on certain sections of the stage. Did you feel the same or? Yeah, poor old Ballerini pulling valleys to keep the gap at five minutes <laughs> for Van Sevenon to drop the minute they accelerate on poor Doi. Like, if I was him, I would have been really, really pissed with Mauro, but he's young and, um, yeah, probably not to be repeated. And Ballerini, mythical climber in the third week of the Giro. I should mention our show partner, Zwift. If you want to try a long climb yourself in the comfort of your own home, perhaps you're wanting to get out onto the big holes in the summer, you can try the Alp on Zwift, a long climb. I think it can be an hour. It depends how fast you go. Similar gradients, some of it to the finish today on Fedaya. If you want to check out Zwift, the online cycling platform that does make indoor training and your cycling fun, you can go to Zwift.com for a free seven-day trial. So it all looked normal. San Pellegrino is not that hard. Bahrain, no point blowing it up there in my view. Cordoy is not that hard either. They had pulls dropping a little bit. They had they were pulling the valley with Switzerland, keeping the break at five minutes. It all looks normal. They get to Cordoy. Covey in the break attacks. He's got Formulo behind, so very smart from UAE to play them like that. As I said, draft really, really matters on this climb. Novak, Kamna, don't chase because two of the strongest climbers in the break because they're satellite riders. At least that's what they were saying at the time. Formula won't chase. And so Aaron's and Ciccone have to and they don't want to. So it goes to a minute, Kobe gone. In the GC group, Holes paces the whole of poor Doi. And when he did that, and that Bahrain didn't pace any harder, it became, at that point, it was now impossible for Lander to win the Giro. Im- impossible. You cannot even, he needs a one minute buffer for the TT and he's one minute behind. So he'd need to take like two and a half minutes on on Fadai. Impossible is 20 minute climb, even if someone has a terrible day. Like, 
Could they have done anything differently to Benji? Is it Bahrain's fault or the parkour's fault for having such an easy second climb and hard first climb, uh, hard last climb? I think uh, both. First of all, the parkour, we spoke about it quite a few times already, having the hardest climb at the end with such percentages, this encourages, this incentivizes people to go early on a stage like this because they know, okay, if I get over this climb, we've got a bigger one at the end. So that's going to be a tough one. That's why I prefer like a Stelvio stage like the Hindley one two years ago, for example, where you've got a Stelvio before a smaller climb at the end because then you incentivize people to attack. But next to that, when it comes to Landa, I it would depend on his form, you know, if he doesn't attack and he ends up being very strong on the final climb, then it's a mistake by the team. But if he doesn't do anything and he's shit on the final climb, then he also wouldn't have gained much from attacking in the first place. So it would depend on the outcome of the race, to be honest, if it was a good strategy or not. And I think their legs probably decided what would happen at that point for the team. But when it comes to pool spacing also, like when he was spacing the gap to Kovi didn't even like change too much. Kovi was literally riding at the same, if not at certain points at a faster pace than we saw Bahrain pace in the peloton. So that was an indicator that even with pool spacing, it was not the tempo that pools would do on a hard last few kilometers trying to split up the group itself. It felt like a bit of a fake tempo, you know? Yeah, he was doing like five watts per kilo, I think. Like, Ben Swift was sitting there comfy. He's a fine climber, but you know he starts to be put under pressure at the 5.5 sort of range on these 30-minute climbs, and he was sitting there comfy. And even I thought, okay, there is no point. Like people are like, why didn't Lander attack? Listen, there is no point attacking on a 5% wide highway with climb like this. Like what are you going to do? The guys will snap into your wheel and what can you do? Now, on the other hand, you can have Butrago pace really hard the last three kilometers. You have Novak in the break ahead. You have a hairpin technical-ish descent coming up. And you can actually launch Bilbao like DSM did last year on this descent. Maybe it wasn't technical enough. That was the only thing they could have done. They didn't do that. And so when we crested the, the second last climb, uh, everyone was like, this is really fucking boring. And it was. like It really was pretty bad. And Bora weren't doing anything. And I was like, oh, they've let the bonus seconds go up the road. It was weird because Bora ch- started chasing the break when they had 10 minutes yesterday. Bahrain kept the break close and then let it go on the climbs. Really weird. I don't know. Um, but I don't think it mattered in the end. I think when it comes to like Bora, I didn't expect them to take the stage on early necessarily on the parkour like this. Because when we went into today's stage, we had such small differences between Karapaz and Hindley that they don't really need to take it up early as long as they give it their all on the final climb and make the difference there. And I guess uh, the next two kilometers would be important in seeing that. But up the road, Kovi was ending up uh, with two minutes at a certain point. Novak attacked the breakaway behind him. Novak decided to do that probably because, well, I don't know, like... He was so confused, dude. He was so confused. Explain me. What is the Novak situation? He thought he was in the break to be a satellite rider. That's why I think he was there. He thought that. And then he, you could see him at the car and then Bahrain didn't use Butrago on the second last climb. And listen, if Bahrain had Tratnik, they could have tried some different stuff this year. Like, let's not pretend that not having Tratnik wouldn't have helped a lot. Um, probably was the stage yesterday. And I think he was like, well, fuck, if Landis not going to attack, can I go for the stage? Because he'd been just following the whole time. Now, that did help him conserve... <laughs> But they gave Kovi like 2.30. It's too much. And I think with Novak working with Aaron's man and Chicone, it wouldn't have been that. And so he will cut to the chase. Kovi basically rides away, gets that huge gap, does start to crumble a bit on Fadir. It's steep as hell. And the gap is going down quickly, but he holds it off 30 seconds ahead of Novak. And Chicone was 30 seconds back, 37 seconds back. And Novak, after the stage, was really pissed. They caught him in sort of the feed. He was saying, I'm not happy to the camera is how I lip read it. And he was like, because he was fucking flying. <laughs> like he could have won the stage. So like Caruso last year. So he was unhappy. But let's go back to GC now, Benji. Get to Fadaya. Me and you were about to, we'd already got the title ready. Worst finish to a Giro ever. We had it ready, prepped in drafts on YouTube and Anchor. And then 
Bahrain are pacing with Petrago on the shallow slopes. It ain't hurting anybody. Ben Tullis looking there, looking good. Then Ineos, as it gets steep, send Ben, is it Tullet or Tullet? I'm going to call him Ben, ben Tullet. He, he starts pacing hard at Sivakov. And I thought Carapaz was feeling good. Otherwise, what, why would you pace so hard? Yeah, otherwise you would be pacing like a fake tempo in some sense. We know that for Bora, we still have Kemna still up the road somewhere. We don't know where at that point because we don't know a time gap from Kemna. But we know that if Ineos is pacing quite hard, they're trying to make it hard enough to try and drop Hindley most likely to try and pull this race towards Katapals. But, well, the following situation ended up occurring where Karapaz ended up without domestiques because Sivakov was the last man to keep on pacing and then Sivakov pulled off and Karapaz didn't directly go and what was the next thing that happened? We see Leonard Kemner called back from the breakaway. Immediately, Hindley accelerates. He does, and it's sort of what we've expected from Hindley. He has looked good on like Blockhouse and these other clients, but he's been reluctant to pace, I guess, with Karapaz in the wheel. This changed here with Kemner absolutely drilling it with Carapaz in the wheel, Landers drops. So I guess you you immediately forgive Bahrain for not setting it nuclear if he wasn't on a great day. Carthy was there looking good, trying to move up from 10th to 8th in GC. And all of a sudden, with Kemna pacing on the steep slopes of the diet, Carapaz is dropped off the wheel. Kemna swings off and Hindley rides away. And we have like three kilometers well over six, seven minutes left on this climb, and Jai Hindley was absolutely flying. Good cadence. I wonder what the gearing was he had on the bike, and Carapaz looked like he was struggling. This is one you want to go back and watch. The last half an hour of this stage, go to GCN Plus, who support the LRCP Giro coverage. You can watch every kilometer live and ad free on GCN Plus. Catch up when it suits you on GCN Plus with full stage replays, on demand highlights, and all LRCP listeners can get 25% off if you're in the US, UK, Australia, Canada, or Germany from an annual GCN Plus subscription by heading to gcn.eu slash LRCP in the description down below. At that point when he dropped in Benji, when you crack and when Hindley's going like that, even visibly, like you could see the speed difference, the Jira was done. Yes, yeah, certainly. And you also got to remember, it's still like three-ish kilometers of like steep climbing on the Fedaya. This is not a climb that like flattens out towards the top where Karapas can try and somewhat keep the damage flowing. It's he has to keep up completely. And it looked like Karapas tried to follow Hindley and Kemna as much as he could. And I started noticing just before he dropped that he started shaking to the left and the right way more than he usually does. And I was like, okay, this is trouble for Karapas. And the moment that he kept on holding on, that also meant that he was trying to hold on as much as possible, which puts you in that limit that if you completely blow up, you will lose so much time in a significantly short time. And this came to the point where, like you said, when that gap was created, when Hindley was storming off at the front, when Kemna did some work for him, then went, then went to the side, Karapaz ended up getting chased by the riders that they dropped earlier and getting passed by the riders that they dropped earlier. Like, for example, Hugh Coffey suddenly came up behind Karapaz and was like, hello, mate, go to the side because he couldn't actually pass properly because too many people at the side of the road to go through and Carfi just basically drops him right there. And then you know that Karapaz is not doing the same watts as he did earlier on the climb and the gap is only extending and it got even funnier when Kemna dropped back to Karapaz, then kind of started to like play with him a bit and then eventually sat in his wheel for quite a bit and then decided to attack him as well like, Oh, that's the emotional damage, right? Yeah, Kemner was doing a fantastic job. And I think the first time Bora have used a satellite, this Giro, because Kemner was... Zwihoff, to... stage 14. Oh, they used Zwihoff? Okay, I must have been slepping uh, during that stage. But yeah, Carapaz, I think he's done this twice now. First was in stage eight of the tour last year. Pagatcha attacked. Carapaz tried to follow on cold Rom. Uh, oh, no, it was, was Calderon stage. It was the second last climb, and Carapaz went completely over his limit, and Pagatra ended up taking three and a half minutes. And today, I, I think it's unavoidable. There is zero possibility that Carapaz isn't shipping huge time to Hindley today, but really the draft, it doesn't matter. 
Like it really doesn't matter that much on these gradients. And he's gone so far over his limit. He's had to like reco- almost take a full recovery in the climb. Like he's having domestiques come back to him. He's having guys who were dropped come back to him. He clearly, well, it's 2020 hindsight, of course, because you follow and then you don't lose time. Then mm-hmm. yeah, you've won the Giro. <laughs> but I don't know. I think he loses much, much less time if he follows at his own rhythm. I think so as well, but I think we also need to note that while the draft itself, the scientific draft doesn't matter as much, I think that the mental part of having a rider supporting you still, like Kemna was doing for Hindley, does so much for riders that we don't necessarily see in the numbers, for example. And I think it's also next to that, when you actually like drop, it's like... Especially when they drop the competitor. Yeah. Then you're like, we're on now. Um, you don't have to surge. You, he's done the work for you. Uh, and also, the, another tactical thing to think about is, and riders do this. Dowsett mentioned this in the, even in the group header. He's like, I'm going to try and hold a pace that I know I can't hold for the whole climb, but mm-hmm. if I'm there, maybe he stops. And then the pace will go down and I can recover and I can essentially call his bluff that he won't ride that way. So maybe Carabas thing, if I hold onto his wheel for three minutes, four minutes, Henley will stop. And that's what happened on Blockhouse. That's what happened on other climbs. But I don't think it would have happened today because Henley would have just kept pacing full, I think. And they knew Carapaz visibly looked like he was he won't no Hollywood performance today. But anyway, just an absolutely monstrous performance from Henley. I think this is probably uh, it's one of the best climbing performances this year, probably the best climb performance so far. Early numbers look like sort of 6.7 watts per kilo range for 18 minutes. And considering it's the back end of the third week, it's had, you know, they still went over a couple of 2,000 meter passes and they're going up to 2,000 meters here. That <laughs> That's a ridiculously good performance. Yeah, and next to that, if those numbers are indeed the numbers that eventually are like estimated and so forth and the numbers you wrote, then that is also an indicator because I've never seen Karapaz ride at those numbers, I think, at any point in his no, career. No, he can't do them. So it isn't really a surprise that if Hindley rides those numbers that Karapaz is dropping on a climb like this. But it's like, it's just an insane performance. And also next to that, it's, it's been such a wild ride with Hindley over the last two years. Like, it's like the highs of 2020, then the very lows of 2021. And then I was completely unsure of him this season. I, I didn't expect too much after 2021, I'll be honest about it. But I'm so glad that for him, he proved everybody wrong in that sense. And that he was able to do this because now he's in that Maya Rosa with quite a significant amount of time. And I think... There's a possibility here that Henley's level has been camouflaged this entire Giro, but not really. It's kind of been hiding in plain sight. But this whole third week, we haven't had a mountaintop finish. And even Blockhouse, it's not 10%. It's hard, but it isn't like this. And here you have a 20-minute whopper kilo test of draft. Doesn't matter as much. And Henley's just ruined Carapaz with a big, big performance. And as Benji said, Carapaz is sort of like a his cap is like 6.5 for 20 uh, sort of region. He's done less than that here, I think, to be losing that much time. Uh, he would have been following Hindley at probably 7 plus when he cracked. Um, but yeah, huge performance from Hindley. And he goes into the GC lead 125 ahead of Carapaz, taking, by the way, I should read out the results. I'll do some quick maths. Hindley finished on 230, and that was one minute and 20 seconds on Carapaz, about one minute, 30 seconds. Carthy passed Carapaz. He only finished 50 seconds behind Hindley. Carthy rode this completely at his own pace, but he's a steep hill monster. He won Angleroo stage. He loves steep stuff. Lander came back, dropped Carapaz. Lander put 39 seconds into Carapaz after being dropped the minute the Ineos Domestique stopped. So he obviously rode his own pace. Um, and yeah, just huge. Carthy gained so much time. Yeah, when it comes to like Landa, he didn't even try following. He just no. like 
sat up to the right and was like, yeah, this isn't happening, guys. I'm not calling back Novak for me because I'm getting third on this GC anyway. And he kept riding his own tempo with not a rider that was with him, but actually, you know, was it Carthy that was still with Lando when he dropped? Uh, I think Carthy was there, but then Carthy dropped him, but then Lando yeah. came back to Carthy. It was tough because they were showing the stage finish as well. Uh, it was sort of all over the place. But yeah, Hindley 125 in GC now going into this TT ahead of Carapaz, 151 ahead of Lander. So there should be no changes in GC in the TT tomorrow, barring bad luck or incidents. 125 is a lot, even on a – it's a 17-kilometer TT – with a climb in it, 4K is 5.4%. Hinley's not the best time trials in the world. You'll remember he lost the Giro to Gagan Hart in the TT two years ago. This is amazing, the symmetry here coming back to close that chapter. Carapaz, though, he's not a good enough time trialist at 125. That's why, Benji, if this was 35 seconds... It would be close, 40 seconds, but the Carapaz full blow up is what's really put this out of doubt for Hindley here. Yeah, I think so as well. And oh, it's looking at the time trial that's coming up, it's going to be very difficult to find any tension for the uh, number one spot in GC. And what spots are we, what spots are we looking at then, then when it comes to the spots that can still change in that time trial? And I'm, I'm saying that. Second and third is relatively staying the same as well. When it comes to fourth and fifth, I'm also saying that they're going to stay relatively the same. Yeah, Bill Bowers, TT is terrible. The entire top 10 is the same, or do you see that Garfi passing a Lopez, or, or is both their time trial pretty bad? Like, I don't see much changing in the top 10 at all tomorrow. I think it's all going to be about the stage win. I mean, Carthy's TTs not look good, but Juan Pei's, he's probably pretty bad too. It's, it's a battle of the terrible time trials tomorrow. It's <laughs> Guillaume Martin's missing. <laughs> it's awful. Guillaume Martin attacked on the climb today, by the way. What the fuck yep. are you doing, man? Um, <laughs> stop. Uh, although nothing was really happening. Yeah. No, nah, I don't really see many changes unless Pozzo's really, really injured, but then Juan Pei's not a good time trialist. Jan Hirt against Bill Bill. Bill Bow, Bill Bow's been bad, but not that bad. Yeah, it should all be the same, which <laughs> is a bit of a shame for the TT, yeah. but Mara Venue said that he didn't want the final TT changing the results. Let's talk about Ineos, though, Benji. Mm-hmm. I said it after stage seven. If you have the strongest team, if you have a difficult stage, don't miss up opportunities to attack. They have been very defensive, although the race has been made defensive for them, and they seemed happy pretty much to come to this stage with three seconds. Yesterday, they sort of set up Carapaz to attack on the final climb. Well, of course, we're now 2020 hindsight, but mm-hmm. that's the beautiful position we're in. How could they have ridden this Giro differently? Well, to be honest, I don't think we could should even look at the 2020 hindsight thing because just like in the 2020 Tour de France, we see that Jumbo Visma was controlling it, playing it very defensively. And you were noting, and I think I noted as well during that Tour de France, for example, on the Persoud stage, are they throwing stuff away here? And they're not using the best capability to try and make sure this Grand Tour is theirs. And they're missing out on opportunities to gain time on people, stuff like that. For at least one or two stages, we mentioned that in that Tour de France, and it came back to bite them in the ass in the final time trial as well. Now, I still don't know if that would have made a difference for the final like GC for that race, the Tour de France 2020, but it did do something at least when it comes to the differences between Pogacar and Rolich before the final time trial. I see a lot of parallels with this Giro where there were opportunities on medium mountain stages for Carapaz to take more time and they decided not to. They decided to play defensively because they probably trusted Carapaz more and underrated Hindley in the way that he rode. And I think a lot of people underrated Hindley at the start of this race, and I was one of them. And do you think that you can blame them for underrating a rider like Hindley after his performances of last year compared to the yes. way you could blame Yumbo uh, in 2020? Yes, because I think after Blockhouse, it was reasonable. Like Hindley showed, of course, listen, Han, you know, Mayor Culpa, I was bearish on the Hindley signing. I thought. Bora had gone and got some second tier GC guys, but their goal is to win the Tour de France and the money they their budget, etc. 
and Hindley had a down year last year. He's obviously proven that Giro 2020 was not a fluke. Even if he does, something terrible happens tomorrow. He's proven that wrong and that he's maybe on his day the best climber in the world and in a TT-like course, he's unbelievably good. He hasn't had team support all Giro just in Camden today and the uh, the stage last Saturday, 14. But, yeah, I think after Blockhouse, you have to be like, ooh, with Fadaya coming up, Carapaz isn't this, like, nuclear watts per kilo destroyer and this is that test. Is three seconds really comfortable? Because as we saw, Hindley Benji, he might have just attacked in the last 1,500 metres. Carapaz might have had three minutes of weakness in the Giro, three, four minutes of weakness, lost 15 seconds, and maybe if there was a stage of the bonus, and he loses the Giro after three weeks' work. It seems, as you said, it's, it is like that Tour de France. It seems a lot to risk to, you know, the three-week Giro, riding that defensively in case, and just hoping something good happens. And I'm watching, I'm just re-watching to make sure Carapaz got his domestiques to pace Fairly hard on Fadaya. Yeah. I'm watching. It's 3.6 Ks. Tullet's ripping it. Bring he drops Valverde and Dom, like he's dropping people. And then Sivakov went as well. Like I don't understand why he would get them to pace. Too much confidence. But just pace slower. Like what's <laughs> no seriously? Then get if Hinley attacks. We Hinley had no domestiques. Like what's if he attacks? Then the domestiques for Ineos can pace Carapaz, right? Yeah, did they forget about Kevner being up the road? That would be a mistake, in my opinion. Like, hmm. I think they certainly rode faster than I expected them to ride, but I think it comes from a position of expecting that it's going to be similar to the previous stages where there was not that huge difference between the performance of Carapaz and, and Hindley. And today, Hindley was just simply better, and they weren't ready for that. I wonder if Bora knew... And I still, obviously, what they did the other day when they paced after 10 minutes for the break, I still don't think it really makes sense. But I wonder if Bora knew they're like Jai is flying and if he can do X, Y, Z on that Fadaya climb, that's the one to really peak for. He's going to steal this Giro with Ineos having to carry the Malia for, what, two weeks or a week now. Other teams having to work. Let's do what we did in the 2022 post-mortem though, Benji. We, I've said, okay, they made a mistake pacing too hard. They did pace too hard. Sivakov dropped Jan Hit on Fedaya and Hit slowed down. Um, what stages could they have done anything differently on? Who? What stages? I, I'd have to go back and look at the stages here, to be honest, to like figure that out. But I'd say the medium mountain stages are the ones I'm looking at. Because but when was Hindley weak? When did he show weakness? He didn't, but... Maybe he didn't because they didn't try on the medium mountain stages. Maybe. I mean, on that uh, stage that Carapaz attacked, the uh, stage 14, Hindley looked really good. I guess Carapaz did try, but Ineos weren't planning to try anything on that stage. It was Bora trying um, to light that up with Kelderman. Stage 7? That? Yeah, they didn't do anything. Because that was the kind of stage where you said a raid could happen. We had that steep climb with 40, 50 kilometers to go. That's something where something like that could occur. And eventually that stage was a breakaway stage with no action in the peloton, you know? Yeah, I know. I'll have to look back. I'm not sure it was as simple as all oh, they should have. Because, you know, in Tour de France, Roglic literally didn't chase Pagatra <laughs> on Paris Like it's yeah. all, all that, you know, it's quite obvious to say. Uh, there's no example maybe when Hindley... Maybe had the flat tire, maybe didn't have the flat tire in the other 10 sprint stage. I'm not sure that made too much of a difference. But yeah, as I said, the only perplexing thing to me that's coming to mind right now that's really curious is Carapaz having Sivakov reduce the group to himself, Hindley, Lander, and Carthy on Fadaya. Like he's setting a hard pace, very, very hard. And Carthy is no slouch on these gradients, he's top on these gradients. And it's played like Hindley mustn't have believed his luck because when Sivakov pulled off, he could just bridge to his satellite rider yeah. and then drop Carapaz. Yes, but I also think that if Ineos would have paced slower, that Hindley would have eventually attacked them anyway. And then perhaps Sivakov can try and help Carapaz quite a bit. But I still think Hindley completely destroys Carapaz then. 
Yeah, I think so. But maybe it would have been – all I'm talking about is – and I, I, this is not something – Remember when – what was the stage, Benji, when Quintana attacked Froome on Alpe d'Huez and Froome's just Jesus. like, I don't know what year, and Quintana put some good time into him. But Froome just is like, I'm going to ride this pace. If I ride this pace, he can't take more than X. But I guess this is different here where Carapaz ain't Froome. He ain't Dumoulin. His TT isn't that good tomorrow. Um, but, yeah, I want to give a huge congrats to Bora. They came here, they won Blockhouse stage, Camner won a stage. Uh, Hinley's been unbelievable. I would say Bora have got Hinley to a better level than he was at the 2020 Giro because he has been on for three weeks here and from stage one pretty much and he was more third week flying for DSM in 2020 and yeah, big congrats to them. And who do you think's winning the TT tomorrow, Benji? Ooh, winning the TT, I think that Vanderpool said he wanted to try and win it. He was in the breakaway today, despite his teammates or his team manager saying that he shouldn't go in the breakaway. I'd um, I'd say either Vanderpool or Rafini are the names I'm writing down. I think the climbing might be a bit too much for Rafini, so I'm going to... Well, to be honest, he's been climbing relatively well. I'm going to go for Vanderpool anyway. Why not? Vanderpool should be the favorite or second favorite, at least. He has to win combativity. Van der Poel's been in the break so much. I think he has to win combativity. Uh, but yeah, Giro or Vuelta final time trials can have very, very odd results. I would have picked Yates to win this if he was still here, but he isn't. And I sort of agree. MVDP is the one I'm looking at for a weird... Now, actually, I'm going to go with Time and Aronsman to win the TT. And top three should be some nice odds as well. Aaron Smith, he did well enough well to final TT. So look out for that. But yeah, I do want to end on the final climb didn't save this stage for me, Benji. Imagine this is the second last climb. They go over it. Landers dropped Carapaz. Carthy's dropped him. They've got Novak ahead, Kamna ahead. Now we've got an epic stage with the poor Doi to come and maybe Ineos Domestiques can bring Carapaz back. I think even though this was a awesome ending for Hindley and Bora, if you were designing it, would you reverse those two climbs if that's actually logistically possible? I would do that, actually, if it's logistically possible, but I'm not sure it is. I don't know. <laughs> I think it is, right? I think so. I saw some Twitter accounts putting them back to back to back. So I think it is possible to put them like that. So anyway, f- food for thought, I would say coverage of the GC group was better today. It was better. Let's get some split screen action next year. Also coverage, Giro, by the way, the RCS changed uh, like the host broadcaster or who manages it. No dropouts this year, but they didn't have crazy bad weather, although it did rain a few times. But I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Thanks to Zwift, as always, for being the show partner of LRCP. Go and check out the stage replay on GCM+. Plus If you want to see Hindley snatching the Malia Rosa from Richard Carapaz at the last gasp, huge congrats to him, the West Australian. West Australians are flying in GC right now, him and O'Connor. And we'll see you with the recap of the TT tomorrow. Ciao.